Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both joined by Derek Young here on this Thursday, getting ready for the weekend, which will take us into week number two, Saturday. K-State at Tulane as the Wildcats have some different things that they could certainly improve upon from their opener. The offense might have more uh, immediately on their plate to improve than the defense, but both definitely could find some things. Before we jump into what we got for you today, talking about what Connor Riley and Joe Klanderman had to say, we first have to remind you that the Cats are going overseas next year to start their season because the Wildcats are headed to Dublin, to Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. And that way you can make sure you are in the stands week zero watching K-State and Iowa State start the college football season. And depending on how that ends up uh, going for the Cats, you might just be you know, watching them get a one-game lead on everybody in the Big 12 and sitting pretty for a couple of weeks with an unblemished uh, spot atop the Big 12 standings. That would certainly be the hope. Just don't pull a Florida State. Yeah, do, yeah. don't let one loss in Ireland turn into a second loss in the United States. Boy, that tough tough way to start the season for Florida State fans. Uh, turns out maybe that everybody was right last year when they said, well, your quarterback's hurt, so you probably shouldn't be in the playoff. Uh, that worked <laughs> out well for the people that thought that. Uh, all right, let's uh, dive into what we're actually here for, and that's the talk about Joe Klanderman and Connor Riley, both meeting with the media today. First time we get to hear their thoughts after the season opener. And we should probably just start with Connor Riley because I think he is the the man that probably had more interest from the fan base coming off of the uh, home opener on Saturday after the offense struggled and sputtered a little bit at times in the early going. And I don't think Connor Riley tried to deny that a whole lot today. No, he talked about the uh, not being as good as they wanted to be on third down and some missed opportunities in the passing game, whether that be not running a route perfectly, not reading the defense perfectly, um, whether that be the quarterback or the guy running the route, uh, just uh, a little bit of off timing, uh, maybe not going through the progressions quickly enough. Kind of a, you know, if one little thing wrong here, one little thing wrong there. Things that he all also very boldly said, so you could tell with with a lot of confidence and panache behind it that it was all correctable. Um, he put on a, I don't want to say a front because I think it was genuine. He the way he presented himself today was that this is correctable and I'm not worried, um, which I think has to be reassuring if you're a Kansas State fan. So uh, that's what immediately comes to mind if we're going to talk maybe about some of the more critical components or components that we can be critical of from uh, Saturday's performance and maybe what didn't go well and what nobody liked. Um, he says is correctable, um, that they will get corrected, didn't seem concerned about it, but it was just, you know, little first game errors here and there. And then that probably kind of goes into what I would say is a, another takeaway that I would have and that Connor Riley had as well is the low snap counts. Um, because you had some of those mistakes and errors and, and you lack that rhythm, you don't get into that groove. It becomes kind of a low possession game in itself and a low snap count. Uh, Avery Johnson and the ones that were with him, I think, you know, with the maximum amount of snaps, that was 43. It's not a lot, obviously. He said that was a practice of them not, not getting into their groove, um, not finding a rhythm, uh, the new you know, play clock rules and how things are going now too, because snap counts and possessions are down across college football because of these new rules. And also because of just the way the game kind of unfolded, you know, Avery Johnson throws an interception that kills what could be, you know, another four to six plays that drive. Jace Brown fumbles the opening kickoff of the second half that, that takes away a possession. Um, it's a good thing, but the special teams blocks a punt scores a touchdown that takes away a possession. So I think they also missed opportunities, but also a lack of opportunities and a lack of snaps that kind of hurt things a little bit as well because it sounded like he really wanted to get to some more stuff that they didn't get to and maybe wanted to see Dylan Edwards even play a little bit more that they, than when he didn't get to. Well, that's good to hear because I wanted to see Dylan Edwards play more early in that game. But 
there's part of that that if I if I were to hear that, I go. Uh, I, some of that feels a little uh, not not necessarily like intentionally trying to make excuses. I think those are valid reasons, but we also could still see that. Well, even with all that, the offense struggled. But I can't understand where he's coming from because you can point out and say they're just. It was tough to get a rhythm early in that game, and and that is essentially true. I mean, what they go three and out to start. I thought they could have been a little bit more aggressive on that first series of the game, but they play it conservatively, which, you know, the smart deal. The punter had just punted a really stupid ball uh, that was not very good, so you play the field possession game, you're good. They come out, they get the touchdown on the next drive, and then the next drive that you think you're going to have, you know, good field position again, that's when the blocked punt happens. So then you're not going to be able to go out there and recapture the momentum. So there were some disjointed things that went on. The the fumble then as well that took place to start the second half. There was just large gaps. They eventually figured out and got it going. And I think we saw once they were able to get that rhythm, I mean, they the, the number one offense scored on their last four possessions of the game. They went field goal, field goal, then touchdown, touchdown. And that's where they started to finally get those uninterrupted possessions. So I, I will give Connor Riley that, that there was a little bit of weirdness with how it played out. Uh, and I, but I, and I think he was still, tr- you know, obviously saying this, but they still have to get better from what we saw on Saturday. I, and he mentioned the slow start and, uh, and as you just alluded to, and kind of like the offensive line sputtered a little bit at the beginning and then kind of took over. And even in that first drive, uh, maybe there was a lack of aggression, but on third down, Dante Cephas is open and Avery Johnson just didn't hit him. Yeah, the, I think both of those guys uh, deserve a little bit of blame on that ball too. So that's just another one of those things that th- this group has to get figured out. There's a lot of new pieces and, and new roles within this offense that uh, you can't let stuff like that happen and we'll see if they've learned from it uh, moving forward. What Outside of the concern or questions that people had about the offense from Saturday – uh, what else did Connor Riley say today that you found notable? Yeah, I just commended the tackling and the the mistake free football that Tulane plays on the defensive side of the ball. So those those are things that they'll navigate when playing the Green Wave on Saturday because uh, uh, they just it doesn't sound like they beat themselves on that side of the side of the ball and won't be in the wrong spot. So you're not going to be able to you trick them, so to speak, and. You know, when I asked about if, if if he would, you know, point to one player or a couple of players that really stood out to him in terms of just performance and the, if he what and how he liked what they did, I think we heard DJ Giddens, Jace Brown, and Carver Willis. Makes sense uh, to have some of those guys in there because they they did play well uh, on Saturday, and uh, I think about now moving forward to. Uh, what this offense, the expectation will be for them in this game with Tulane. I mean, based on what you heard from Riley, what you know about this team and what you kind of expect, how much crisper do you think the offense looks on Saturday? Because, I mean, there's a really strong chance that this team is not going to score more points on Saturday than what they did against UT Martin. But there's still a world where the offense looks and feels better in a game where, say, you score – 30 points as opposed to 41. Yeah, I think it will just because I don't think it's like a preseason approach where you're testing things to see how it looks against the real opponent or throwing guys in a certain situation to see how they respond. I think there was a lot of that on Saturday. And again, a lot of disjointedness, especially in the first half with how things unfolded from a situational standpoint. Um, with an actual game plan and structure designed for the opponent because they know they're going to be challenged. I think it looks better just because of that. And, you know, usually, you know, what's the old adage that you make your biggest noticeable improvement from game one to game two. So individually speaking, um, maybe that helps as well. The only caveat being, and we're starting to find out more and more of this, is maybe it's going to be sloppy too because it could be a rainy day. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit in our uh, preview that goes live tomorrow. But the the rain keeps getting deeper and deeper into the day on the on the forecast. Uh, I actually think that there are some scenarios where that benefits K State. Flipping sides of the ball, Joe Klanderman's unit had 
a pretty solid day. They didn't give up a touchdown, allowed two field goals, and one of those field goals came off of a, a play where they almost had UT Martin stopped and, and forced another punt uh, before they got deep down the field. And what did Joe Cl- was, uh, was off the Jace Brown fumble? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, what what did Joe Klanderman say to you guys today, and uh, what were the big takeaways? Uh, he thought that the guys that were experienced and had played before played very, very well and played fast. Guys like a Desmond Purnell, Marquis Siegel, Brendan Mott, and Jacob Parrish, those were four that he specifically called out. There's probably more, and he even said there's there was more. But the guys that were kind of in their first game in that defense, he thought didn't play as well, were kind of sorting through some things, didn't play as fast as he would have liked. So um, they're still, you know, despite the success, still a lot to improve improve upon. Uh, they don't want to be complacent. Obviously, it was kind of kind of the same message I got from some of the defensive players when I spoke to them too. Um, not as like, you know, they weren't going to rave about themselves as much as you would think considering the performance. So, um, I would just say a lack of complacency, and that's a good thing. Um. Asa Newsom has practiced yesterday, according to defense coordinator Joe Klanderman. So they think he'll be ready to play. Austin Moore will be back. That was more of a precautionary thing. Um, he actually did point out he's kind of inferred to Austin Moore's tough as hell for playing in that game to begin with. So um, definitely some pain tolerance there, but I wouldn't expect anything less from Austin Moore on the personality and how we've gotten to know him that seems to be just who he is yeah i'm i'm surprised that austin moore even feels pain <laughs> yeah he's he's kind of that nails kind of player uh well you kind of got the the lowdown on on expectations for tulane's defense did uh, joe Klanderman give any insight into what they expect tulane to do or maybe any of the difficulties with the fact that uh tulane starting a young quarterback and also their depth chart is just a mess at the quarterback spot. It's just all three guys are listed as an or for the starter. Uh, so what did Joe Klanderman think of having Tulane on his plate after what went down, uh, where the defense actually played where, well against Tulane two years ago, yeah. if you think about it. like They only gave up 17 points. They forced two big turnovers. It was just K-State's offense couldn't do a lot in that game. Yeah, it- it seems like a team likes to throw a lot of eye candy at you, apparently. You know, a lot of tempos, a lot of different formations, uh, a lot of different motions pre-snap. So uh, you're going to be tested on your vision and your instincts and not making false steps and not being sucked into some things. So there's going to be a lot of misdirection. So they're going to they're, they're try to play with your eyes. Well, that sounds familiar to... Really a lot of teams these days, but we know that KU was big on that uh, the last couple of years with Andy Kotelnicki. And maybe not as severe, but UT Martin also frequently was sending guys on Saturday all, all over the field pre-snap, just trying to give some different looks. So, uh, it'll and be they, saw these, to they saw these coordinators last year. It's the uh, same coordinator. Yeah. He brought over his coordinators from Troy. Yeah, so that – I mean, f- there's definitely some, I think, inherent advantages for K-State here where – Yes, you've seen Tulane recently, but not a lot of the talent from that team is still on this one. Um, but then the biggest help is the fact that you saw Troy last season and this team shut down Troy last year. I mean, we thought Troy could be kind of a, a tricky G5 game coming to Manhattan and K-State took care of it. And Troy still ended up being a, a really solid team last year in the Sun Belt. They did. Um now, these coaches have the, the benefit of seeing K-State before, too. Um, not necessarily the players that they'll be coaching in this game, because as we said, a lot of talent from that Slane team in 2022, I think most of it's gone. I'd be surprised that there's, you know, I don't know if there's really any con- guys that played a considerable amount of playing time that still remain on this roster. And, and the fact that, you know, Kansas State has changed coaches on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, be fascinating to watch. Uh, any other things that we didn't get to today from either – coordinator that you want to mention before we get out of here nothing nothing comes to mind um i guess a little bit of a hint and spoiler is that i like I, I don't feel like this is the scary scary game that Tulane was in 2022 yeah i i'm i'm with you on that we'll talk about that more tomorrow but uh i i'm in the same boat as you where 
because Tulane has the recency of being good and even more severely the fact that they beat K-State, I think they're a trendy pick for a lot of people or at least think this could be a grind and it could scare you. Look, there, there's no givens when going on the road, uh, especially you know with these weird opponents like this, but at the end of the day, this is a different team and we'll see how it all unfolds for K-State this weekend. And we'll have the full preview for you tomorrow right here on KSO. So be sure to check that out when it goes live in the morning. In addition to that, you can get all of your K-State coverage right now over at On3. Go find kstateonline.com. Get hooked up there. If you are not a member of the KSO community, uh, now would be a good time to do so because you're already a game late. You're already a game behind. You can do all the catching up you need to do, whether it's recruiting or team stuff. You can do it right now over at KSO. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, previewing the cats in the Greenway.